Welcome to Murder Road Trip. I'm your host, Haley. Joining me on today's road trip is my New Zealand friend, Jess. Jess is going to be on Murder Road Trip for at least two episodes a month. Where can listeners find you? Listeners can find me in the Murder Road Trip discussion group. I'm always hanging out there. Yeah, like you never leave. I know. It's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> we will be snacking on two Pennsylvania made snacks Philly cheesesteaks and peeps as we make our way to Pennsylvania State University to discuss the murder of Betsy Ardsma. Jess, why did you pick Philly cheesesteaks and peeps? I don't know a lot about where food is from, so I googled um, snacks from Pennsylvania and they were two of the ones that showed up on the list. I've never had a Philly cheesesteak, but I feel like I would like it. And I love peeps, but you can't really get them in New Zealand, so... They're only for special occasions when I can find them. So that's why I picked them. Well, when you come here for Crime Con, we definitely need to get you a Philly cheesesteak. That sounds amazing. We'll have to do it. And then also, peeps are gross, but I'm trying to be nice to you. (sighs) Well, you're wrong. (laughs) Jess also picked the topic for today's road trip. What made you pick the murder of Betsy Ardsma for today's trip? So, once again, that was thanks to Google. So I found a list of murders online and I had a look into Betsy's case and I found some aspects of the case really interesting and also really frustrating and that made me want to look into it more. Yeah, I had never heard of this case until you sent it to me and I also thought it was really interesting so I'm glad you picked it. Thank you so much for being my new road trip co-host. Thank you for having me on Murder Road Trip. Are you ready to go? Let's do it. We lost the station again. Uh, keep trying. I'm safe. Hold on. Let me try this one. Stop. That's it. Turn it up. Turn it up. Elizabeth Ruth Ardsma was born on the 11th of July, 1947. Elizabeth was known as Betsy from the moment she was born in Holland, Michigan. The city of Holland was founded by Dutch Americans, and most of the population were, and still are, ancestors of the Dutch settlers. Holland is a very religious city, with two main churches that were both extremely conservative. Betsy was the second child of Esther and Richard Ardsma, who had two more children after Betsy was born. Betsy and her siblings led a fairly normal childhood from what I could find. Her parents were involved in their local church, the Trinity Reformed Church, her father worked for the local government as a sales tax auditor, and her mother left her teaching career to raise her growing family. Betsy was said to have participated in many after-school activities from a young age right through to high school. Betsy attended Holland High School until she graduated in 1965. She was a member of the National Honor Society and even graduated fifth in her class. In 1965, with the goal of becoming a doctor, Betsy enrolled at the nearby Hope College. She did want to attend the University of Michigan, however, she changed her mind and decided to attend the same college as her parents. Hope College was also known for their pre-med papers, so she decided that would be the best option for her. However, Hope College was quiet and dull, and Betsy grew bored. The college had strict curfews and rules, and it wasn't living up to her expectations. She decided she wanted to join the Peace Corps, and didn't think that staying at Hope College was going to get her there. So, in 1967, Betsy transferred to the University of Michigan, where she originally wanted to attend, and where she knew the Peace Corps had a large presence. I did also read that while Betsy was at Hope College, there were several young women killed in the Ann Arbor area, one of which has been attributed to the co-ed killer. It is thought that the killings made her feel unsafe in the area, and that she would feel safer at University of Michigan, away from where the killings were happening. Once at the University of Michigan, Betsy decided that she was no longer interested in medicine, and she decided to change her major to better reflect her interests in literature and poetry. Her new degree was demanding, and she studied hard. She also became interested in a young man, David Wright, who became her boyfriend. 
David was studying pre-med and the pair enjoyed spending their free time together. They quickly became an item. Betsy completed her undergraduate degree at the University of Michigan, where she graduated with honours in 1969. As I mentioned before, she had intended to join the Peace Corps when she finished her degree. However, her boyfriend David said he wouldn't wait for her to return. Not wanting to lose her boyfriend, she decided to follow him to Penn State, where she enrolled in a master's program. Betsy started an English graduate program at Pennsylvania State University in the fall of 1969. She had a goal of being a teacher, hopefully a college professor. On Thanksgiving Day, November 27, 1969, Betsy spent the evening in Hershey, Pennsylvania with her boyfriend David and his friends. As the evening went on, she grew more worried about an upcoming English project. She asked David to take her to the bus station so she could head back to Penn State. The next day, November 28th, Betsy left her dorm room in the late afternoon with her roommate. She headed to Pate Library to meet with a professor at four. After her first meeting ended, she headed to see a second professor. She finished the second meeting, then headed to level three of the library to look in the card catalog. After Betsy found the card she was looking for, she descended to level two of the library. At approximately 4.45, a fellow student climbed the stairs to level two and asked to borrow a writing utensil from Betsy. The student used the pen and then brought it back to her. A few minutes later, a man using a nearby copy machine heard books falling and a metallic clanging noise. He then saw a man running from aisle 51. As the man ran toward the copy machine, he yelled, That girl needs help! The man using the copy machine found an unconscious Betsy in aisle 51. Another library occupant also headed to aisle 51. Another library occupant also headed to the aisle and attempted to revive Betsy, but was unsuccessful. The library employee called an ambulance at 5.01 p.m. Paramedics came to the library under the impression that a woman had simply fainted. When they were unsuccessful in reviving Betsy, they put her on a gurney and took her outside. Betsy was taken to the campus student health center, where the doctors there, assisted by ambulance staff, administered CPR. The doctor twigged that something more serious had occurred after seeing blood on Betsy's chest while she was receiving chest compressions. By that stage, it was too late, and Betsy passed right there on the gurney. This must have come as quite a shock to the medical staff. After all, they were working under the assumption that Betsy had just fainted, and all of a sudden they find that she's bleeding and their treatment plan couldn't change quickly enough. Betsy was declared dead at 5.19pm by the doctor at the campus health centre. However, there are reports that she wasn't declared dead until around 30 minutes later. The state police arrived on campus and were present when the health centre doctor discovered the stab wound in Betsy's chest. The police declared the case a homicide. As I said, when Betsy was stabbed, it took a while for anyone to notice that she had been, and there were two reasons for this. The first is because of what she was wearing. Betsy was wearing a red dress made out of a jumper-style fabric. No one noticed the blood around the stab wound because it was a similar colour to the dress. The material wouldn't have helped either. My understanding is that a jumper-style fabric is stretchy, and where the knife ripped the dress may not have been as obvious in a stretchy fabric as it would have been in, say, a cotton top. Another reason why it took so long to notice is because there was no blood pool around Betsy. The way that she was stabbed and how she fell meant that the blood pooled inside her lungs instead of seeping through the dress and around her torso. I do wonder if she could have been saved if the wound was discovered sooner and if she'd received the right treatment immediately. So I actually read an article about that where a doctor in the last couple years reviewed the case and said that in similar cases it has been found that the person wouldn't have been able to survive. The only way she would have been able to survive was if they had immediately hooked her up to a blood transfusion machine like the moment she had been stabbed and that's in today's technology not in 1969 technology so yeah it's really sad that even today she wouldn't have been saved immediately that is really sad and at least the doctors know that they did everything they could for her even if what they did wasn't the right thing you know they, they did do everything they could. They couldn't have done anything differently and had a different outcome. That's true. That would be really reassuring to know. Yeah. An autopsy was performed on Betsy that night. 
The autopsy results showed that Betsy had been approached from the front by a right-handed person. There were no signs of a struggle, meaning that Betsy most likely knew her attacker. The attacker managed to hit Betsy's pulmonary artery, and upon entry, blood immediately started entering her lungs. Betsy couldn't scream because the blood filled her lungs so quickly, and she was dead within minutes. The autopsy also showed that the murder weapon was most likely a four-inch, one-sided knife. After the autopsy, Betsy was laid to rest on the 3rd of December, 1969, in her hometown of Holland, Michigan. The funeral was held at her family's church, the Trinity Reformed Church. You may remember that earlier I talked a little about how religious Holland was. That may help to explain why, at Betsy's funeral, the pastor was said to have declared that Betsy's death was God's will. Her pastor also read out a poem that Betsy wrote at high school. The poem was entitled, Why Do I Live? And this was said to be evidence of Betsy's faith and showed that she believed it was God's will for her to die. The funeral was attended by family, friends and classmates. Betsy's boyfriend David attended the funeral and bought a dozen roses which were placed in the coffin and buried with Betsy. After Betsy was taken out of the library on the gurney, library staff cleaned up aisle 51. They mopped the floor, put books back on shelves and more. The library staff thought Betsy had just fainted. They didn't realize they were actually cleaning up a crime scene. The first responding officer was stunned to find that the crime scene was not only cleaned up, but multiple people had walked all over the scene and potential witnesses had been allowed to leave the library. Police began their investigation by conducting interviews with library occupants. Witnesses couldn't tell police much more than that they heard the sound of Betsy hitting the shelves as she fell and that they saw the man running from aisle 51. Police also spoke with Betsy's roommate. She told police she hadn't seen or heard anything unusual, and she also told police that Betsy had a boyfriend. After police found out that Betsy had a boyfriend, officers drove to Hershey to meet with him. They questioned David, but quickly found out that he had a solid alibi. He had been studying with multiple people in the library. Since the boyfriend didn't do it, police had to look for other leads. They conducted hundreds of interviews with people who knew Betsy and people who were in the library that day but the interviews never led anywhere. Police also searched the campus for the knife used to kill Betsy. They never found the knife. Penn State put up a $25,000 reward for information leading to the arrest of Betsy's killer, but when it was unclaimed, the reward expired in 1972. So who killed Betsy? Many infamous killers who were in the area, such as Ted Bundy, the Unabomber, the Zodiac Killer, and the Alphabet Killer, were thought to be responsible. But those theories were quickly put to sleep when police realized that they couldn't have possibly been the killer. One of the most popular theories was that Betsy was working undercover for the FBI or the police, and she was killed after turning someone in. This theory was debunked when police found no trace of Betsy working for either agency. Another theory was that Betsy was killed because her dad worked for the government, but police found this to be unlikely because her dad worked for the Treasury, not exactly a super top secret agency. The most believable theory comes from two authors, Derek Sherwood and David DeCock. Both authors believe that a man named Richard Hefner is responsible for Betsy's murder. Richard was a geology student at Penn State. He had been casually dating Betsy until October when she said she wanted to end things because she was serious about David. When police interviewed him, Richard was overly prepared for every question. He knew exact times on exact dates, which is rare. Richard told police he was at dinner at the time of the murder, and later police would find out that right after the time of Betsy's murder, Richard ran to one of his professor's house and asked if the professor had heard that his ex-girlfriend had been murdered. The professor told police that Richard seemed sort of excited. Richard was let go the day of his initial interview and was interviewed again in 1970, but he was never arrested for the murder. During their independent research, both Sherwood and DeCock found quite a few interesting things about Richard. He had an extreme anger towards women. At one point, he was casually seeing a woman long distance. When she ended things, he became obsessed with her and even traveled to confront her. 
This information led the authors to theorize that Richard became fixated on Betsy and killed her when she refused to be with him. When the authors spoke with people who knew Richard, no one wanted to talk about him, and those who did end up talking about him said that Richard would bring up Betsy a lot. One of Richard's employees said that he witnessed Richard's family members saying similar things to, Are you going to kill me like you killed that college girl? on multiple occasions. The authors also found out that Richard was a convicted pedophile. This information led them to theorize that maybe Betsy saw Richard with a child and he killed her to cover his tracks. Although Richard appears to be the most reasonable suspect, he died in 2002. He had a hole in his chest and was hospitalized. While in the hospital, Richard got up to use the restroom and fell in the bathroom. After he fell, his chest was filled with blood and he died. How ironic. You can find more information about the murder of Betsy Ardsma in Who Killed Betsy by Derek Sherwood and Murder in the Stacks by David DeCock. So Jess, one question I noticed a lot of people had, including police and the medical examiner, is why was Betsy so dressed up in that red dress if she was just going to the library? Many people referred to what Betsy was wearing as her Sunday best. The only thing I can really think of is that she was meeting her professors before she went to the library and maybe she just wanted to look nice and maybe more professional. Since she was a master's student, maybe that was more expected of her to look presentable and professional with with her professors who were kind of more like colleagues at that stage. Or another reason I can think of is that I've been to university and sometimes your washing does pile up and that's all you've got to wear is a really nice dress and you just kind of have to go with it. So maybe she'd just run out of clothes and she was just wearing what she had. That's something I didn't think about. Maybe she didn't have time to do laundry, especially since it was right around the holiday. And you're right, maybe that's literally the last thing she had left in her closet. Another theory I had was that maybe she had that dress packed away for when she went to see David. And since she came home early, she already had the outfit picked out. She was like, oh, I might as well wear this. Or maybe she just dressed up and wanted to feel pretty for the day. You know, who are we to judge? Yeah, we all have those days where we wake up and think, I'm just going to put on something a little bit nicer today and, you know, do my hair and just feel you know, feel like dressing up. I think that's a pretty normal thing to do as well. Yeah. So the age-old question, who do you think killed Betsy? I don't know if I've got like a really serious definite theory about who killed her, but I do think that Richard seems like the most likely suspect. If you look at all the points that were made by both of the authors and all those little details, I think that he is definitely the most likely. I can't think of anyone else who would be more likely unless it was just random, but she didn't fight back. So she had to have known her attacker. So I don't think it was random. I agree with you. I definitely don't think it was random because she didn't scream. If somebody came up on you quickly with a knife, I would think, you know, a lot of people's immediate response would be to scream. And like you said, she didn't fight back. There were no defensive wounds. I also think that the most likely suspect is Richard, though I don't feel like I know that 100%. Um, and that's, I think, because it hasn't been proven officially. Yeah. I think it is more likely that he became obsessed with her and he met her in the library and was like, you know, will you go out with me or will you please see me again? And she said no and he got mad and and stabbed her. And, you know, he was a geology student, so it wouldn't have been rare for him to have this knife on him. And so maybe he just got really mad and, you know, stabbed her. I mean, it's definitely a strong possibility, isn't it? Yeah. Do you have any final thoughts on the murder of Betsy? Just that with all, I mean, all murders are, are sad and, and tragic, but 
I feel like, you know, she was so young and she was working so hard towards having this life as a teacher or a professor and, you know, she could have changed lives and, and that's just really sad that she didn't get the opportunity to do all of that and that was taken away from her for a reason that there's never going to be a good reason but we just, we don't even know what the reason was, why that was taken away. So I think that just makes it all the more tragic. I agree. You know, unsolved murders, it's so upsetting to not know the reason why something happened. And like you said, she did have such a promising future. It is upsetting to hear that she just got stabbed and we don't know why. It appears to be for no reason. Oh, poor Betsy. I know. Well, thank you for coming along for the ride, Jess. Thank you for having me. I didn't spill any Philly cheesesteak in your car, so you're welcome. Fine. If I find even one piece of meat, I'm going to be so mad. (laughs) I guess we'll see you again in two weeks. You will. I'm really excited to be coming back on. Me too. Until next time, please remember to check your back seats, and we'll see you at the next rest stop. If you didn't already know, you can also listen to me on the We're All Just Pretending podcast where I give bad advice on purpose. You can also find Haley and I on the Playlist podcast. Playlist is a podcast where Josh Hallmark of the Our Americana and the Karen and Ellen Letters has different podcasters on to talk about their favorite songs. Every episode has a different theme and a new panel of podcasters. You can find Murder Road Trip at MurderRoadTrip.com, on Instagram and Twitter at Murder Trip, and on Facebook at MRT Podcast. If you're interested in continuing the discussion, you can join the Murder Road Trip podcast group on Facebook. Make sure you check out the Murder Road Trip playlist on Spotify. You can even add songs to the playlist. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to rate, review, and subscribe on your podcast app of choice. Please stay tuned after the music to hear from some other great podcasts. Bring out your inner detective with every episode of the Hidden Staircase podcast, where I, Sammy, deliver stories and true cases of mystery and murder. You can join us at the Hidden Staircase discussion group on Facebook, or you can like us on Twitter at the Hidden, and we'll talk about everything mystery and murder. You can also go to accproductions.org slash hidden staircase to learn more about the podcast and the episodes we've discussed. Don't forget to lock your doors and hold tight to your flashlight. Hi. This is Hannah from the Film Rose Podcast. Hi, I'm Jen. My name's Vanessa. Hi, my name is Stacy, and I listen to Our Americana because it reminds me how important community is. Because it tells the stories of people and places in small town America that we'd never get to hear about anywhere else. I love hearing about parts of our country that I didn't even know existed. And the reason I listen to Our Americana is for the stories. Stories of average Americans, stories that I otherwise may have never heard. I liked hearing about the younger generation moving back home to these small towns or moving out of these big cities because they were so passionate about community. The podcast has definitely inspired me to want to visit America. Despite being such a huge nation, it is clearly the people and communities which give it its heart and soul. Not only is Josh a great narrator, but he's a great listener. He's very good at capturing the essence of people in the essence of a small town. Our Americana changes the way I look at America. It's not just my little town with my little struggles. Josh tells stories I didn't even know I needed to hear and gives small town America a platform to shine. I'm Josh Hallmark, the host of Our Americana. I spent six months living in a van, traveling the country in search of what it means to be American. What I found was community and connectivity. And so I created a podcast to celebrate that. And what better place to start than small town America? Whether it's the West Virginia mining town where a gay club is the center of the community, or a seaside village that was adopted by an orphaned orca, or a Minnesota town that was revitalized by a dog. The heart of these stories is always community coming together in spite of their differences for the greater good. America is so much more than what we see on the news. 
and Our Americana celebrates that. You can listen to Our Americana on iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher, and all your other favorite podcatchers. <laughs>